So this is a photo of my friend, Brittany. She's from a little island called Trinidad and Tobago. It's a tad east of Venezuela. She's part of a community known as the East Indians, a community that I never really knew existed until I made the move to Toronto, which is kind of weird because I'm Indian. Naturally, in attempts to tackle this ignorance, I researched. I researched a lot. a brief visit to the house. These are the East Indians, or Hindus, we mentioned earlier. Thrifty, patient, plodding folk. It is truly remarkable how these people from faraway India so steadfastly retain all their national traits and oriental peculiarities, no matter how distant from home they wander, or how many years or generations they may be away. Welcome to Carib Nation. I am Paul Nero Tennessee. Today we will be looking at East Indians in the Caribbean. We will be examining many aspects of the Caribbean people's li lives in with respect to the East Indians. For example, how did they get from India to the Caribbean? And over the last 160 years, what they have been doing in the Caribbean. So you might be wondering how this all started. You see, in 1835, the British had just abolished slavery. Mm -hmm. I see. But they still needed plantation labor, and they wanted it for cheap. So where were they going to get that plantation well, labor? That's a great question, Raquel. You see, a lot of it came from... Something known as the Indian indenture system. Basically, this was a system the British Empire devised to gather Indians, coolies as they call them, from the north of India and bring them to European colonies to labor. There was well over a million Indians displaced, primarily from the northern regions of India, more specifically Uttar Pradesh and Bihar, which is pretty close to where I was born. These indentured Indians ended up in quite a few places, such as Trinidad and Tobago, Guyana, Suriname, French Guyana, and Jamaica. They would be made to put a mark on a document, a legal document, which signed away their freedoms to a particular employer for the duration specified by the indenture. Now this could be five, seven, ten years. You essentially would no longer be a free man. Given the high levels of illiteracy, few workers really understood the terms of the contract they just put their thumb onto. And many were commonly misled about where they were departing for and the wages they'd received there. The journey took over three months. It was over 9,000 miles. 20% of them died before they even got there. So while you sit on your couch right now and watch this, how about we take a moment and think about those individuals who just got randomly displaced, tossed into another side of the world, without even knowing it. You're here, and then you're there. Why the fuck did that even happen? For a bunch of sugar? For something we avoid putting on our coffee today? So right now, I'm below the Prince Edward Viaduct. You can probably hear the train above me. See, this bridge was built in 1918, which is actually the year that all of this got abolished. 
just think about that in retrospect. That there were people being displaced till that day, till the date that this bridge itself was built. This is Trinidad. This is Tobago. Tobago mostly consists of Afro-Trinidadians and Tobagans. These people are largely of West African Sub-Saharan descent. Every year on August 1st, the Afro-Caribbeans celebrate Emancipation Day. This holiday marks the end of slavery in the British Empire. And every year on May 30th, the East Indians celebrate Indian Arrival Day. Today, many East Indians consciously choose not to celebrate this holiday, as they believe it's implicitly erasing the history and actual brutal experiences of the indentured, as well as furthering the divide between the East Indians and African-descended communities. And uh, it was more or less at the behest of the plantocracy that East Indians kept their marriage systems, their Ramayana, their Quran, um, and so on, because they didn't want too much mixing between ex-slaves. Because of solidarity, exactly, they would have class exactly. solidarity. They didn't want too much mixing. And if you look at the system of settlement in places like Trinidad and British Guyana, you will find that there were separate villages that were created for East Indians yeah. and blacks to prevent this kind of intermixing, and hence solidarity. This is the first time I ever got my hair cut. This is my Mundan ceremony. A Mundan is a Hindu ritual where a child's hair is cut off and given to the gods as an offering. What's fascinating is that they still do this in the Guyanas, Trinidad, and Jamaica. And it's been over 180 years since they left Indian soil. And yet, Hinduism is still prevalent and celebrated today. The indentured were a fragmented group, whose only unifying thread was that they all came from India. The fragmentary nature of this group could result in an Indian slowly being enveloped into the larger society. Instead, the opposite happened. East Indians formed a tight community that began to redefine the larger society in order to make a more pronounced space for themselves. I'm realizing that being Indo-Caribbean is a certain hyphenated existence where one's identity exists within the tension created by these two worlds. Indo-Caribbeans have been able to carve out a unique space for themselves, which has allowed them to remain a separate and distinct group even now in North America. Thank you. Yeah. Take care. Okay.